It's a great privilege to be here speaking at the legendary um, McGill Summer School. Forgive me if I begin back in the mists of time when I was a young and clearly naive journalist. The year was 1984. I was working on a full-time freelance basis for the Irish Independent and being fleeced every week by the extortionate emergency tax rate. Somebody recommended an accountant to me and I went to see him. He was a sober-suited gentleman who charged me £25 and told me to buy a box of chocolates, go along to the revenue office in Nassau Street in Dublin, smile sweetly and ask for help. So off I trotted with a box of double centres and a brown paper bag, <laughs> slid them across the counter and asked for help. At once the chocolates came whistling back across the counter at me and an extremely irate official fulminated that she was prohibited as a civil servant from accepting inducements. Mortified, I ran from the building faster than you could shout fire and dropped the chocolates into the lap of an astounded man wearing neither shoes nor socks as he begged on O'Connell Bridge. What I learned from that experience, apart from the obvious lesson never to listen to an accountant, <laughs> was that a formalised code of integrity existed in Irish public life and its bottom line was that doing favours was not in the public interest. Sometimes people say that the men in mohair suits with their brown envelopes operated in an era of obliviousness to the effects and the boundaries of corruption. It echoes the plea of ignorance you hear in relation to child sexual abuse, the defence of nobody told us it was wrong, but that civil servant knew it was unethical to accept the chocolates from me, even as around the corner and up the street in Leinster House, the Mohair men were putting the effing mafia to shame in the famous words of Tom Gilmartin when he was faced with an extortion ring of government ministers in Leinster House. We know now that Charlie Hawhey received the equivalent in today's money values of 45 million euro from so-called benefactors between 1979 and 1996. I don't know about you, but I have never met a rich man who just gave me money for the sake of it because he thought I was a nice person. The tribunals chaired by McCracken, Flood, Mahan and Moriarty mean we can never again claim we didn't know about the abuse of power for personal benefit, to quote the definition Transparency International provides for corruption. Judge Alan Mahan says in his final report that Ignorance and apathy are both corruption catalysts and that because the pathways of corruption are ever-changing, measures to fight it must be constantly reviewed. Indeed, corruption's chameleon nature was thrown into stark relief throughout the lifetime of the Mahan and Moriarty inquiries. For 14 years, while they, while they ploughed on, politicians like Bertie Ahern avoided answering questions about the evidence being uncovered of his and his party's anti-Irish activities by insisting that we had to wait for the tri tribunal's final reports. Often we were told falsely, and I believe deliberately falsely, that the tribunals were sub judice and could therefore not be discussed publicly. Not that this stopped Ahern and his cabinet from vilifying the Mahan Tribunal for supposedly being on a witch hunt against him and generally rubbishing all tribunals because of their inflated expense, ignoring the inconvenient reality that it was politicians who set their terms of reference and their lawyers' astronomical fees. Although, you know, the lawyers could have said no thank you to the two and a half thousand euro a day. Against this censorious soundtrack, the biggest property bubble in history was being hothoused outside the old garrison walls of Dublin Castle. Noel Coward said that the higher the buildings, the lower the morals. Des it's a good one. Despite an abundance of housing, the number of families on housing waiting lists doubled between 1996 and 2008. A statistic such as this shows how disingenuous and inflammatory is the post-boom catch cry that sure we all benefited and we all lost the run of ourselves. 
Some of those high buildings of the boom have started to come down now, but there is scant evidence that public morals have started to rise in parallel. It was the usual suspects who benefited most from the Celtic Tiger, and the reason many of them did so is because our society continued to be ambivalent about low standards in high places, right throughout the existence of the tribunals. A Hearn's tear-stained interview with Brian Dobson in, two, in September 2006 captured the invincible amorality of the political culture when the Taoiseach of the day blithely declared on national television that he appointed people to state boards because they were his friends. Let's take Michael Bailey as one example of those who rode the pigs back during the stifling Celtic Tiger years of loose morals and a tight crony circle. In June 1989, the Beauvale Developments Director famously visited Ray Burke, a former Minister for Justice, for God's sake, at his home, Briargate, in Swords, North Dublin, and handed him a sum of money believed to be 40,000 Irish pounds. In his second interim report published in September 2002, Judge Fergus Flood concluded that this amounted to a corrupt payment and that everyone present at that meeting was aware it was such. Flood also concluded that Michael Bailey bribed George Redmond when the latter was the assistant Dublin city and county manager. The report charged that Michael Bailey had hindered and obstructed the tribunal, that he gave false oral and documentary evidence, and that he attempted to undermine the tribunal by damaging its integrity. Undeterred by these findings, or by a £3 million retrospective tax settlement with the revenue commissioners, Bailey then applied to the tribunal to have his €1 million uh, Euro legal costs paid by the state. Meanwhile, he continued to pay for a table in Fianna Fáil's fundraising tent at the Galway races every summer, and his company took out a full-page advertisement in the party's in-house newspaper, entitled The Nation, no less. A year after the flood report came out, Beauvale's annual accounts showed the company's profits had shot up by 300%, from 14.8 million in 2002 to 69.2 million in 2003. It had assets of almost 100 million. Michael Bailey and his brother Tom were paid 9.8 million euro each, making them the biggest salary recipients in Ireland. Fast forward to the present day. Michael Bailey has never even been charged in connection with the bribes he paid, despite the Prevention of Corruption Act 2001 providing for a maximum penalty on conviction of 10 years imprisonment. To add insult to injury, his company Beauvale Developments has had its loans transferred to NAMA, the agency we the citizens own at a cost of 30.5 billion euro. Fool me once, as they say, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Though we citizens are saddled with Beauvale's debts, we are not allowed to even know how much they actually are, because NAMA is exempt from the remit of the Freedom of Information Act. Pulling down the shutters on public information and, by extension, on transparency and accountability was one of the most tangible accomplishments of the Fianna Fáil PD alliance hatched in 1997. They brought in prohibitive charges for FOI requests that were among the highest in the world, if not the highest, and they exempted a host of public bodies from the legislation's remit. One such is the Dublin Port Company, where Ahern appointed his close friend and a former Fianna Fáil councillor, Joe Burke, as chairman, not once, but twice, despite Burke's less than illustrious history as the owner of a number of failed and liquidated companies. Next door to the port company, Sean Fitzpatrick, the kamikaze Anglo-Irish chairman, sat on the board of the Dublin Docklands Development Authority, to which the government granted full self-governance for construction planning. It is little wonder that the single biggest property to scandal to unfold during the existence of the tribunals was the Dockland Authority's joint venture with Bernard McNamara in a 412 million purchase of the 25-acre Irish glass bottle site. When additional costs such as stamp duty were factored in, 
the final bill came to 431 million. Last year, the derelict site was valued at just 45 million euro. This is what happens when you give your pals this is what happens when you give your pals state assets as playthings. But that was then, you might say, Ireland has woken up to the stink of corruption and has built a legislative ring fence against it so that these things won't happen again in the future. And I say, I give you Michael Lowry. Last year's Moriarty Tribunal report described as profoundly corrupt Lowry's attempt to increase a state company's rental charges for the benefit of his old pal, Ben Dunn. The state has spent untold millions investigating Lowry's corruption since the McCracken Tribunal was set up in February 1997, following revelations by journalist Sam Smith of his fishy financial relationship with Dunn. The subsequent Moriarty Tribunal further found that it was beyond doubt that Lowry, as Minister for Communications, facilitated Dennis O'Brien's winning of the state's second mobile phone licence. O'Brien, it found, had enriched Lowry by almost one million in the form of cash payments and the enabling of a loan. Lowry had already availed of a tax amnesty, but having failed to reveal his offshore accounts, he had to pay another 1.4 million to revenue. Judge Michael Moriarty wrote, I quote, in the cynical and venal abuse of office, the brazen refusal to acknowledge the impropriety of his financial arrangements with Mr. Dennis O'Brien and Mr. Ben Dunn, and by his contemptuous disregard for his taxation obligations, Mr. Lowry displayed qualities similar in nature and has cast a further shadow over his country's public life. End of quote. It is repugnant to every precept of democracy that this man continues to occupy a seat in Dáil Éireann. A country that does not recognise that and do something about it is a country still in denial. Indeed, the opposite is the case. Larry continues to enjoy ready access to government ministers. Dunn continues to personally advertise his gym on the radio as if his good name is his unique selling point. And O'Brien has been invited to the Global Irish Economic Forum at Dublin Castle and to share the platform with the Taoiseach and the New York Stock Exchange as if he is the epitome of the best of Irishness. The voters who have consistently returned Michael Lowry to the Dáil since his contempt for democratic values was first exposed 16 years ago are often demonised in the media. That argument is of merit but I think it is actually unfair to those voters who have remained loyal to Lowry because he's delivered for their constituency. This sort of clientelism has been avidly nurtured by politicians and their parties since the foundation of the state. By creating a culture of dependency, the very system set us up as a bunch of mugs to be done. After all, not all corruption is a crime. In cases of patronage, favouritism, political donations and personal relationships, no law appears to be broken, even when it may bear the hallmarks of not only corruption, but I suggest treason too. When politicians use the power vested in them by the people to secure their own positions, that is what we used to call just politics. There was no law broken when Charlie McCreevy, as Minister for Finance, announced his decentralisation master plan to relocate 10,000 civil servants around the country. Remember uh, his colleague Tom Parlin's triumphalist banners during the following general election, Welcome to Parlin Country. After just 1,000 citizens moved at a cost of €290 million Euro to this country, the plan was abandoned. Last week, I came home from a trip abroad and arriving at Dublin Airport, I noted the portraits lining the walls of the arrivals walkway. My gaze, I must admit, lingering a little bit longer on Pierce Brosnan and Gabriel Byrne. Uh, there, among past presidents, Taoiseach, Olympians, acclaimed writers and peacemakers, was a photograph of Dermot Desmond, who is regarded as one of the richest men in Ireland, though he's not actually in Ireland as he is resident for tax purposes in, I think it is, Gibraltar. In 1991, John Lacken, a solicitor appointed by the government to investigate the purchase by Telecom Aaron of the old Johnston Mooney and O'Brien site in Ballsbridge, found that Desmond was a beneficiary of that transaction. 
He denied it volubly and said he would publish a rebuttal of Lacan's findings. Maybe he's a slow writer, but two decades on, that hasn't materialized yet. Last year, Desmond was among a group of 17 people who penned a document entitled A Blueprint for Ireland's Recovery. Dennis O'Brien was another of its authors. The representatives of that group of 17 were among the first to enter government buildings after last year's general election for a private meeting with the Taoiseach to discuss their recipe for Ireland's recovery. Their document, their document recommended, among other measures, that we sell off our air and seaports, reduce regulation, give employers a PRSI holiday, establish an expert group to eliminate fraud and social welfare, cut red tape for business, and improve Ireland's reputation abroad. There is a saying that if you look after your character, your reputation will look after itself. Ireland needs to start working on its character. The corruption that Moriarty described as endemic is being addressed piecemeal by new laws on whistleblowers, lobbyists, and ethics in public office. We have even seen a corrupt politician jailed for his crime, albeit he was a former local councillor who was unmasked by his scorned wife. To borrow a phrase, there is a lot more to do. We have to, for instance, make it possible to expel somebody like Lowry from the Dáil. As a recent European Progress Report on Transparency Levels in Ireland reminded us, it is imperative that the powers of the Standards and Public Office Commission be expanded in order to deal effectively with wrongdoing by our elected representatives. It would be wrong to assume that the tribunals have uncovered the full extent of Irish corruption. What they have laid out before us is a mere fraction of it. That is what's most worrying about this government's decision to shut down the inquiries John Gormley had begun into planning decisions in six other local authority areas. The scope for favour buying is endless when you think of the licences, the permissions and the state contracts that are regularly sought and awarded. I remember the day Frank Dunlop, the corrupt former government press secretary, got into the witness box at the planning tribunal and in tabloid parlance started singing like a bird. At the back of the packed public gallery watching him, I spotted a familiar face. It was John Hanrahan, the county Tipperary farmer who fought an heroic legal battle all the way to the Supreme Court more than 20 years ago to prove that Merck Sharp and Dome, a pharmaceutical multinational with a plant near his farm, was polluting his land. During a break in the tribunal hearings, John told me that he and his wife, Selina, had travelled up from Carrigan-Shore to attend the tribunal because Dunlop had been engaged as a PR consultant by Merck and had run a campaign of reputation assassination against him, claiming Hanrahan was a bad farmer and that was why his animals were dying. I'm not suggesting that what... Uh, what um, Dunlop did on behalf of Dunn was corrupt. I am just saying that while that man was going around showering councillors in Dublin with bribes like confetti, he was causing the most extreme anguish for one of our citizens and his family. It truly is an appalling vista when you consider how many pies the likes of Dunlop, Liam Lawler, Ray Burke, Michael Lowry, Charlie Hawhey et al. had their hands in. In his report, Judge Alan Mahon said that corruption is a failing of individual mora uh, morality. In order to protect our country against that ever-present reality, we need a change of heart as well as a change of mind. And that means no more sneaking regard for the cute whore. In France, President Francois Hollande has appointed a moralization committee under the chairmanship of Lionel Jospin, to recommend how public life there can be cleaned up and better reflect true Republican values of fairness and equality. Were we to have such a committee in this Republic, I suggest we should begin at the infancy of our citizens. Right from the start, there ought to be a civic awareness that corruption is unacceptable. Teaching philosophy in primary schools would be a very good start. How wonderful it would be to someday have a country in which we, the citizens, feel we are entitled 
to the highest standards and those we elect to work on our behalf. I'm sad to say that I see no sign that that day is fast approaching because we will never stop corruption until we stop celebrating the corrupt. Thank you.